Welcome back, everyone. My name is Rodolfo Luna. I'm a, I'm a professor of scripture at Audley School of Theology. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, I'm, I am very appreciative of the quality of our discussion and the respect that is being shown, and at the same time, the uh, outspokenness of our, of our concerns. I think this is, this is good work. This is very good work. So let's move to another um, difficult aspect of what we can find in our world and in the Bible, which is violence and destruction. Um, and our concern for our future. So we all worry for our future. It's part of the human experience to try to see what lies ahead of us and prepare for it as we may. In recent years, intelligent young voices like Greta Thunberg have raised louder than before to claim a future for themselves, taking notice of the massive and compelling scientific evidence of global warming, climate disruption, and resource depletion of land and sea. This past August 2021, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations delivered an updated estimate whereby global temperature will increase by 1.5 Celsius, that is 2.7 Fahrenheit, above the average temperature of the 1900s in 20 years or less, in 20 years. And that is the best scenario, mind you. If we do not cut emissions by half by 2030, that is in 10 years, if we don't cut our, the, the, the world's emissions by half by 2030, we will see the global temperature increase by 2.7 Celsius, which is 4.9 Fahrenheit. This is probably within my lifespan and certainly within yours. We're talking the 2040s. We're already experiencing the impact of human activity-driven global warming in the world and in the U.S., with stronger, more frequent, more devastating fires in the West Coast, all the way up to Canada, and hurricanes in the Southeast. Indifference is most preoccupying. The fact that the common perception may shift from skeptical denial of global warming to unmoved acceptance of the new normal. In 20 years, 9 billion people will be affected by whatever 7.5 billion people today choose not to do in time. 20 years ago, I'm, I'm on a 20 thing, I'm 20 based here. So. 20 years ago, the US was hit on 9-11 by foreign terrorist attacks giving Americans a one-time experience similar to Pearl Harbor during World War II, that is, what it is to have your homeland turned into a war zone. As U.S. troops withdraw from Afghanistan this August 2021, war continues there in Iraq and in Syria 20 years after the events. There their home is still a war zone, war zone. Five years ago, the UN stopped counting the dead in that ongoing conflict. Seven million refugees and seven million people displaced, that is 50% of the Syrian population affected, 90% in poverty, nine out of 10. Who honestly cares? Their predicament? 20 years later, 10 years later, is no longer headline news. War has become the new normal in many parts of the world. And we live with it. With ever-growing populations struggling to grab much-needed resources and very few people ready to share, famine and war both lie in our future and who knows when, maybe even at our doorstep. 20 months or so ago, a deadly virus 
spread throughout the globe, hitching a ride through our complex transport network of planes, cruises, trains, and cars. By the end of August 2021, it had infected 218 million people, killed 4.5 million, and is far from being contained in spite of efficient vaccines tested and produced by science in a record span of time. The World Health Organization reports lower income countries lose more lives to communicable diseases than to non-communicable ones, COVID or not, which clearly shows that pandemics do not strike fairly among countries, even when widespread. Catastrophes, war, famine, pandemics. Where is God in all of this? How, we may, how may we Christians make sense of the state of the world? And how may we profess our faith in a benevolent God and nurture hope in a viable future for all? Many Christians wield the book of Revelation, the apocalypse, as a harbinger of doom and find confirmation of its prophecies in all the calamities that befall us. In their doomsday reading of Revelation, God would be angry at our behavior and ready to wipe us all out for good. Strange creator, this God willing to destroy the world. Yet, this is the most widespread understanding of the book. Even the words apocalypse and apocalyptic have taken on the meaning of catastrophic in common parlance against the etymological meaning of revelation or unveiling. Instead, we should ask, what is being unveiled in this book? Let's look at a particular passage of interest, the opening of the seven seals in Revelation 6. Revelation 4 has shown the heavenly court and Revelation 5 generated dismay at a book in God's hand sealed with seven seals. On the slide, it's below the, the lamp. That no one has, it was able to open until the lamb who was slain and appears victorious comes forward, worthy of opening the seals. Clearly, the image, you know, the book contains material that only God knows, and John is relieved to see that Christ may unseal the book and reveal its contents. When Christ the Lamb opens the first four seals, four horsemen come forth one at a time. These are the infamous horsemen of the apocalypse, harbingers of doom, an image taken from the prophet Zechariah, chapter 1, and then adapted. The first, the first one is armed with a bow, rides a white horse, is given a crown and rides to conquer. At first, we might think of Christ the King, since he is portrayed riding a white horse in Revelation 19 towards the end of the book. But then it wouldn't be ominous at all to see Jesus riding to victory here. And this first rider wields a bow, whereas the very last rider of the book in Revelation 19, the white rider in Revelation 19, wears a cloak dipped in his own blood, and his weapon is his tongue. That, that is what he has to say. Thus he is a true witness, a martyr, not a conqueror. This first rider closely resembles, mocks Christ, but is probably not him. I think it represents human ambition. He was set out to conquer. Human heroes or leaders striving for glory and deceiving us into believing they are on God's side when they are really on only looking after their very own interests. The second rider is given a sword and rides a red horse. He is given the power to take peace away from earth so that people slaughter one another. This clearly refers to war. The third rider holds a scale in his hand and rides a black horse. A voice from, the, from heaven declares one ration of wheat or three rations of barley to cost a day's work. That is an exorbitant price for cereal. 
and indicates the rider represents famine. The fourth rider is named Death and rides a pale green horse. The Hades, or realm of the dead, follows closely the rider. This shows how quick it is to fall sick and die when a plague or pandemic is unleashed. So, four horsemen ride across the earth and their order seems important. Ambition leads to war, which in turn leads to scarcity and famine, people uprooted and displaced looking for food, the best conditions for plagues and pandemics to spread. Even as these calamities spring forth with divine permission, something the passive voice of the verb conveys, they do not represent God's hatred of the living world. Rather, they seem to flow from human sin, and God simply allows the consequences of our greed to unfold, and that is God's judgment. Divine command actually restrains the devastating effect of human sin by limiting its scope. Only a quarter of the earth fell prey to war, famine, and plague, according to Revelation 6, 8. Oil and wine are protected from the increase in cost of living, according to Revelation 6, 6. These details that we tend to forget point in the direction of God's mercy, even as sin rides wild across the earth. The opening of the fifth seal reveals the despair and anguish of the dead, martyrs that have suffered and fallen because they raised their voices against human hubris, ambition, violence, and selfish greed. Everyone has forgotten about them, and their lives seem meaningless. But they are given white robes and encouraged to hope for God's justice, while the living are indifferent to their plight. The opening of the sixth seal brings about cosmic chaos. An earthquake, the sun turning dark, the moon turning red, the stars falling as if a strong wind had shaken the cosmos. Human sin does not only affect humans. It distorts the right order of the universe and destroys its fiber, its harmony and, and beauty. If we fail, the earth falls. It is impossible for me not to comment here that it is human ambition, ambition and greed that has depleted the planet of its natural renewal resources, overheated the atmosphere like a greenhouse, acidified the oceans, altered the currents, and bleached the beauty and balance of coral reefs, reduced wildlife to 35%. Most animals are our pets and what we eat, what we raise to slaughter and eat. Wildlife is reduced to 35%. Cut down the rainforests to feed cattle to satisfy the palate of the rich, while the poor starve and get sick. Our grandchildren may never be able to imagine what our Garden of Eden looked like before we turned it into a desolation of concrete, plastic waste, and dust. After all this, the opening of the seventh seal deserves half an hour of silence in heaven. In Revelation 8.1, we may take a moment of silence to reflect on the violence that we have unleashed on earth, while often blaming God for our lack of resolve to do the right thing now. And I've got two or three questions to stir up our discussion, but I would love to, to welcome the questions coming from the, from the floor. So, just to think about, even if it is not God who directly unleashes all this violence and suffering, why does God allow it to happen? Why does God keep silent when so many witnesses and martyrs die raising their voice? What good is it to reveal this judgment 2,000 years ago if we are still at it 
and nothing has changed, or rather got worse. <laughs>